Hi there, it's January 18th, 2024. Welcome to episode 306 of Rokam Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam Tsonazis. Duruba Shema. Hope you're doing well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. You know, there are so many elements to what happened to Iran and to the people of Iran in the aftermath of the 1979 revolution that catapulted Khomeini to power and in some ways unwittingly and birthed the Islamic Republic, that it's hard to know where to begin when addressing the tragic fallout. How do you possibly untangle the story of an event so seismic that it fundamentally reorganized the lives of generations of Iranians for decades to come? But beyond the obvious atrocities, executions, human rights abuses, the suppression of dissent, the imposition of theocratic rule, mismanagement, undoing of modernism and progress, beyond all of that, and perhaps less spoken of, is the dire cultural implications of the coming of the Islamic Republic. The revolution changed the course of the lives of some remarkable artistic talents whose creativity would forever be repressed and whose careers would be undone. Think of Behrouz Vousiqi, a movie star in his prime who would have to suspend his craft for decades. Think of Gugush being removed from the stages and airwaves of the world. Think of authors and painters and poets and dancers who were deplatformed overnight. We want to focus today's episode on the story of a man of tremendous talent whose gifts would be suppressed by that 1979 revolution and who wrote the kinds of emotionally moving songs that could very much provide a soundtrack for what happened to Iran. The story of Habib, Habib Mohibian, has not really been told in English. A brilliant musician and songwriter with an extraordinary singing voice who released his first album, a hit record, in 1977, just before everything changed. Habib would effectively be exiled to America and would keep his music coming, but without feeling the belonging of being in his homeland. He wrote, he recorded, produced, performed, found his stride again in many ways, but always pined to get back to Iran. And when he did so in 2009, he did so only to have his creativity snuffed out again and to be unable to lead his artistic career until his death in Iran a few years later. The story of Habib is in parts inspirational, wondrous and moving, and tragic and sorrowful. It is a story worth telling and a story worth hearing. And today, we're lucky to have his son, Mohammed Mohibian, a popular musician and personality in his own right, joining us for a feature hour to talk about his dad and the legacy he left. And we will try to pepper in as much Habib melodies as we can as well. All right. Good to have you with us. This is episode 306. Let's get started. This is Rook. Smart Pega, the legacy of Habib. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was telling you earlier that um, Habib is is one of those that he's an interesting case for me because mm-hmm. he's not quite. I mean, as a kid growing up in the diaspora, right. you know, I know the big the big names, <laughs> the one name big names, Ebi. the other one name big names, Abi, Gugush, right. Dariush, Haide. You yes. know, um, I know. Uh, Habib's song, like I know Ma Dad, I know, mm-hmm. you know, some of those songs that all, seems like all Iranians know, but he didn't have or doesn't have that kind of name or stature. Mm-hmm. I spoke to Muhammad in the lead up to our interview today that uh, that he's going to be joining us in a little bit, but we made a phone call a couple of days ago and I was kind of telling him that. I was like, you know, I, I got to say about your dad. <laughs> and he said he partly thinks that's because of his dad's personality, that his dad was always a loner, he he Mm -hmm. said. I I mean, I'm going to ask him about this in the interview, but that he just wasn't, you know, he wasn't this big personality. He was going to be out there selling himself, you know, like it was, um, (laughs) and and very private and very, very much to himself, an Mm -hmm. introvert, he said, you know. 
Um, and, and, and that's interesting. I mean, that that is part and parcel of how people get recognized, you exactly. know, especially in this, you know, this era. Um, so he's, I mean, were you someone who knew the music of Habib growing up? It's funny. It's like those certain songs that you mentioned. I knew who he was and I knew those songs were his songs. But beyond that, I can't say that, you know, I even know of one concert that he maybe had growing up or that it was, you know, his songs were something that I would hear regularly. It was just when I heard it, I knew who he was. And the funny thing is, as you were mentioning that, I agree with you, but there's been a couple of instances where I've run into people and I've said, oh, you know, the greats. And then I've mentioned like Daryush, Ebi, Gugush, that sort of thing. And they've looked at me and they've been like, and happy. Yeah. And I've been like, yeah. Well, well here's yes. something I've learned <laughs> for the last couple of weeks as I've been preparing for this, that, that, just mentioning his name, mm -hmm. the the fans are diehard. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they really believe. It's like I don't even know what the equivalent would be in uh, in in Canada. It's like Rush fans or something. You know, Taylor people Swift fans, Swifties. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. If we, I'm not sure if you want to call the, the Habib fan base Swifties, but yeah, kind of. You know, really, really dedicated. Right. Really, and the thing is, I mean, he he was not an interpreter. He was mm -hmm. a creator, right? He wasn't just singing the songs with that crazy, incredible voice. Mm -hmm. he, he was writing the songs and, and the music and the lyrics. And and uh, there's remarkable stories around some of these songs that become big hits that are that are coming out of his gut, you know, mm -hmm. that, are, that, that are, he's a real artist in terms of what he was doing in an era, we should mention, in Iran when most of the big names didn't write their own songs, right. you know, had songwriters, had, had lyricists, had composers make, writing the music with some of whom we've had on the program, mm -hmm. right? So, so he's, he's quite unique in that way. And yeah, his fans are diehard and legitimately so. But for example, in England, you know, when, when I mentioned in the introduction there that, that uh, I'm so grateful to be doing this in English, it's partly because do a deep dive Google search on yeah. Habib, there's not a lot in English. Yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot in Persian, but not in English. Mm -hmm. And so to tell his story, to talk about it, and to have Muhammad coming on and doing that. And, and by the way, I always get a little um, self-conscious about bringing on the kid of a famous person and wanting to talk to, you know, who's got his own career. Like Muhammad, by the way, some of the songs that people would recognize would be the Muhammad Habib yeah, song. Exactly. Like AD, you know, I, I know that's like yeah. some of some of their, their hits together. I, uh, I, I always have this, you know, especially hearing about um, or talking about Habib and his son, the instant image in my mind is like the photo of, a, of an album that they did together, which I think was called Javuni. Yeah, if that's I'm not the mistaken. First, that's the first big record for Muhammad, yeah. Yeah, and that image that's on the front of this at the time I guess father was and CD, son the father yeah. and son that's like ingrained in my mind I can almost remember what they're wearing what they look like the way he's sitting all of that it's like this image that's just burnt into my brain yeah yeah so I'm doing the pre-interview pre with with Muhammad a couple days ago just talking to him and and I, I'm kind of sheepishly saying you know is it I was kind of thinking to make this all about your dad is that mm -hmm. you thinking you know I'm waiting for him to sound object. awkward or but maybe not object but sort of go well I got a new record coming out, man, right. you know, or something, you know, like we're going to talk about my old man, but he was, he was like, I, I mean, he'll say it, I'm sure in the interview, because he said to me, I, my whole life is about my dad, mm -hmm. you know, I owe everything oh, to wow. him, yeah, so, and they're a pretty tight father and son, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of recording together, performing together exactly. in the in the later years, and then this, oh, just this horrendous story, which, which is not, that unfamiliar to any of mm -hmm. us, you know, who have family in Iran, et cetera, but that his dad goes back to Iran and then he can't, he's not there at the time of his dad's death and awful. it's just, it's just awful. So we'll get to that. Mohammed Mohibyan joining us in just a few moments from Los Angeles on the legacy of Habib. I should mention our, our dear Raha, mm -hmm. resonant Raha yeah. is sick with the COVID. With the COVID. That I can only, I was I was racking my brain in the last couple of days when I found out she had COVID thinking, how did she catch this from you? <laughs> I didn't <laughs> have COVID. Let I, me just I don't care. I don't care what it, I only assume people get sick I only by get you passing it to them. About, oh because gosh, most, of the, most of the sickness that's I, happened in our- I knew it was going to come back to me. How did I know? 
<laughs> most of the people who've been sick anywhere within a two uh -huh. kilometer r radius you know, of the Rook Studio. nothing to do with the fact that it's flu season, that COVID's yeah. on the rise, and the I was weather like, is changing. I don't remember when Pegas saw Raha. So how would, oh, wait a minute. There was that time we, we met at the theater like a couple of weeks ago. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> found it. Well, I'm sure. You know, and was, she wore my jacket. Yeah. Uh, well, see, you're not see? making. I know. I'm just. I'm just feeling the fire. And and uh, I feel like the last person standing to a certain extent because uh, you were sick last I week, was, so it was Raha was. was here and not you. I know. I mean, so the evidence is piling. By the way, that you you passed this on. <laughs> but but how are you doing? I'm honestly. It took me a full week. Like I, today's the first day that I'm kind of feeling like myself again, mm -hmm. and you know, got out of bed and and you know, got ready to come and come into the studio. But it was awful. There's this weird flu going around. Yes. And for anyone within the Toronto area, please, you know, up your vitamins, take your juices, whatever you have to do, because yeah. apparently everyone is getting it, and it's horrible. It's yeah. like headache. Um, it's like congestion. All these symptoms, and it's not COVID. So we had a a, a big guest that we were going to interview this week that uh, she canceled the last minute because yeah. uh, hopefully we'll re because same thing she mm -hmm. she's actually in Toronto and got that um, I don't think it's just Toronto by the way because I'm hearing people uh, seeing it on oh, the American news and everything that uh, uh, all across Spreads the West even further yeah um, so I'm glad you're Thank you're good you. and you're back it's uh, good to be back yeah and you know my week has been dominated by Shakira oh yeah okay um, um, why Shakira not not by my choice <laughs> You know, I, I've been meaning to talk about this for a while. Somewhere in the last, I don't know what happened okay. or h how this happened, but all of my gadgets, mm -hmm. like all of my social media platforms or whatever they, you know, right. all of them think that I'm, <laughs> think, I don't know what it was Super that I, I Googled. I don't know what it, like what I looked at at some point, right. what I said in the proximity of my iPhone that captured, I, I don't know. All I get is Shakira <laughs> videos, uh, clips, you know, Are moments. You humming one of her songs. I don't. I, I you know, and listen. I have I, Shakira's great. Yeah. Nothing against Shakira. I I had the chance to interview her once. Like wow. yeah, met a long time ago. It was at the Bunch of Music Video Awards, and she was she's lovely. But mm -hmm. but I, it's not. I don't even own a Shakira record. Okay, hold on. Being that you're a football fan, did it have something to do with the fact that her and her husband oh. PK, who or ex husband rather, you think because I watch Premier League football, I don't know. I'm just trying to relate the, it somehow. The algorithms <laughs> think I don't know. But it is so weird because it's not just that they think I'm a Shakira fan. I am like a Shakira obsessive. Like, there's no <laughs> video of Shakira that doesn't, like a, somebody capturing Shakira, somebody, that doesn't end up in my That's crazy. Instagram or what, or like Facebook or whatever. Anything I'm open, you know? It's really... <laughs> Shakira's number one fan. It used to be Frenchies because, of course, I have a French bulldog. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, I put up... And so, yeah, that does make sense. Right. Shakira has usurped the Frenchies. <laughs> it's just Shakira now. I can, you know, I can tell you what she's up to, like what her latest appearance on Fallon was. I mean, I don't know. This Shakira. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, well, there, there could, could be worse things. things. Exactly. Uh, exactly. There that. could be worse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we, um, so we made a big announcement mm -hmm. last week. Yes. Um, and, but we didn't announce the lineup. Our first Rook, are you, you're crying. No, What's uh, this, is, with this you? is the remainder of the cold that I oh. had. My eyes are tearing. Oh my God. Are you giving this to me now? I, I got emotional After over Shakira Rahan. is what happened. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's emotional. Wait till you get to Habib. Habib I know, right? The Shakira story. Uh, um, <laughs> would that Habib would be turning up in my, maybe <laughs> I'll get some Habib video. Uh, yeah, it's all Shakira all the time. So Rook Live, yes. our first ever Rook in a theater, which mm -hmm. means we're doing the program in front of humans, we're yes. opening this up to the public, and and um, and we've got uh, special guests. I mean, normally we do long form interviews. This is mm -hmm. going to be shorter interviews and performances. And what a lineup! February seventh at Theater Aurora. The we on Monday we announced the lineup. I'm mm -hmm. just blown away by. Cannot we've got um, Maziar Falahi, mm -hmm. who is not only a remarkable singer and performer himself, but one of the nicest, the sweetest guys that he agreed to do this, you know, come and be part of our show. 
uh, Mazhar Falahi Shiva Nigar, mm-hmm. the great uh, Iranian actress, flying up from LA to do this. Yes. Banafsheh Taharian, who we, our dear friend, who mm-hmm. has Chai with Banafsheh, her podcast, and That's right. uh, has what's her her touring show called? Her from show? lust to loyalty. From lust to loyalty, she takes traditional. Persian Shahnameh stories yep. and redoes them in her own modern uh, style. It's mm-hmm. it's a great one woman show, and she'll be part of our lineup. Yes. And of course, Baba Kamini performing uh, and uh, bringing a couple of musicians with him. So this is at Theater Aurora, February seventh, Aurora, Ontario, Canada. Mm-hmm. I have some stories about Aurora. I'm okay. gonna wait till the <laughs> night of. They're not all good stories, Uh-oh. but me and my relationship with Aurora, be, which if you don't, if you're listening to us, like most of you are outside of Toronto or outside of even Canada, uh, Aurora is just north of Toronto. It's like a mm-hmm. suburb kind of, but it's its own city. The Aurora suburb kind of? Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, the Aurora people are mad at me now. But yeah, to, exactly. They're like Habib fans. They're really into <laughs> Aurora. No, I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of a, I mean, it's, it's sort of just near Toronto, yes. near enough to be drivable within an hour or less you know but uh, right. but it's north of the city and and where densely, the iranians always I was go gonna say, yes densely populated Shomal, by they iranians. always go to the north did you know that if you check out most metropolitan most cities mm-hmm. most urban places in the world iranians gravitate to the north there what is go. that i don't know yeah well find out <laughs> come on you're the well, smart we'll find out before um our february 7th show in aurora that's right uh, Captain Reza will be there. Uh, Anahita is going to do a performance. Mm-hmm. Wine and cheese reception. So limited tickets are still available. You go to Eventbrite and type in Rook Live or just Rook, uh, R-O-Q-E, at Eventbrite. Or just go to our Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the link for the tickets is in the bio of our Instagram. That's right. Can't wait to see you guys there. I'm seeing all kinds of people buy tickets who I have no idea. They're so excited. They're just, it's really fun. Yeah, it'll and be so nice to see everybody in person. Who you know, we've got so many people who comment on things, and maybe we'll see a lot of them in some person. Some of them, so I would great. think. You would think, yeah. Now I have an so Rook Live February seventh. Mm-hmm. Get your tickets. I have another announcement to make. Today. Another big one. Yes. Okay. You ready? Yes. We can announce that in March, jo- March 2024. Yes. Uh, joining us in the Rook Studio. For a special feature episode interview, the producer, the songwriter, the musician, the founder of Black Cats, yes. Shapal Shapare, will be here Very for exciting. a feature interview. I, you know, I've wanted to talk to him for a long time, mm-hmm. and I've always wanted it in the studio, in person. I know. I mean, he is. He's um, unstoppable, right? He I mean, is. he's he, he really doesn't is. stop. He's just a, he's involved in everything, yeah. and he's kind of another pop master in terms mm-hmm. of what he's. You're a Black Cats fan, right? I am. Yeah. I very much am. But I grew up with Black Cats. Like, I haven't always been. Oh, I'll tell you. But the, you? It, it really is like Black Cats was. Couldn't name a Rolling Stones song, could you? But Black Cats, <laughs> yeah. Don't know a Beatles song for. Oh you know, my God. But everyone's you could, everyone's going to start believing this. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You Not what, to this extent. Well, I mean, listen, right. I listen to non Iranian okay. music just seldom. Shapal, Shapare, in the Rook mm-hmm. studio. Very excited for this. To hear his insights, to hear his perspective, starting back in Iran, coming to LA, being such a, a big part of growing the the, the music uh, legacy and mm-hmm. business of Iranian music outside of Iran. Shabal is going to actually be in Toronto for the Bidmeshk Noruz Gala. This is an event I attended last year. It's, got, it's, it's one of the finest Noruz events mm-hmm. around. Saturday, March 16th, they're doing their Bidmeshk uh Noruz Gala. This is at the Universal Event Space in the Greater Toronto area, uh, and the live music guests are Black Cats. And this is a new. You know how Black Cats changed the lineup a little That's bit. Right. Over, there was Kamiar. There was who else? There's Kamran Schubert, Human. Kamran Human. From like way back in the day. <laughs> uh, wasn't Ebby in Black Cats no, at one point? I don't think. Chaperon so. Chaperon was. No. Yeah, he was. was I was he? think Ebby was. Yeah. Really? Super peace saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Back in the day. See, yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, and so they've got the new Black Cats lineup, but they're all, they've also got five guest singers coming oh. who I think are going to be... The new Black Cats? Significant maybe? names. No, no, no. Oh. Like in addition to oh, the new Black Cats. Oh, in addition. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there was, there's going to be a lot more going on at this thing too. The Big Mesh Knorr's Gala, our very own Anahita's dancing at that. Mm-hmm. We have the... There's an open... We have. They have open <laughs> bar, full course dinner, photo booths. Uh, sweets table, DJ, cigar station. Check this out. Late night hot dog and fries. Ooh. 
right? After all the drinking. After all the polo and uh, sadzi polo, <laughs> late, late night hot dog and fries. You had me at hot dog. Uh, anyway, for more, you can go to Bidmeshk Events, bidmeshkevents.com or bidmeshk underscore events on Instagram. And Shapal uh, Shapare here in mm-hmm. the Rook Studio. We're looking forward to that. So, in a few moments, Mohammed Mohebian joining me on yes. the legacy of Habib. But first, I want to actually say a big thank you. Uh, this episode and this upcoming interview with Mohammed Mohebian is made possible with the help of Neely Interiors, the great mm-hmm. Neely Interiors, Pega. Yes. With a gorgeous showroom. Right. I think it's called the design space. Design space. Yeah. My apologies. I think a showroom is for like cars or something. Okay. <laughs> the Neely, Neely Interiors. Elevate your space with Neely Interiors where sophistication meets serious, uh, seamless design. Transform your surroundings into a haven of luxury and style with exquisite custom-made window coverings and luxury blinds, curated opulent wallpapers, impeccable interior finishings, uh, this is high design. And they know what they're doing and they're great at it. And we know that. Yes. Their expertise ex- extends beyond aesthetics to encompass interior renovations for professional offices, clinics, private residences. Experience the epitome of personalized luxury with Neely Interiors, where every detail matters and your space becomes a reflection of your unique vision. Now, if you want to know where to get in touch with Neely Interiors, we've got you look in the description of our uh, of this episode and we'll, we'll put the link there to Neely Interiors but to take advantage of a complimentary design consultation Ooh. Pega for your residential or commercial <laughs> project contact Neely Interiors on Instagram at Neely Interiors or phone them at 437-224-2333 437-224-2333 the good thing about a podcast is you can stop the podcast <laughs> Rewind 10 seconds. Yeah, get that You know number what they would again. say on TV? They would say like a phone number. You'd mm-hmm. be like running to get a pen. Am I showing my age? I mean, not really, but sure. <laughs> do you remember pens? <laughs> I, I do remember, remember pens, Okay, yes. you do. All right, thank God. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 437-224-2333 or visit their showroom in Vaughan, Ontario, Canada. Thank you, Neely Interiors. They wanted to be uh, sponsors of this episode. Um, They believe in telling the story of Habib and Mm -hmm. Mohammed Mohebian. Thank you, Neely. And Pega, we are coming to you on uh, rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. If you want to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Persian, we have a channel on Telegram. Uh, And you can support us by going to our website and pressing the support us button and becoming a Rook member on Patreon. And remember our live show, February 7th, if you're in the greater Toronto area, find our tickets, uh, find your tickets uh, at the link on our Instagram. All right, Pega, you'll be back on the other side of this for a roundup. Let's get to our interview. I know he is there waiting in Los Angeles. You know, there are a few very famous names in Iranian popular music of the last century, and and most of them can be recalled with just one name, Abi Daryush Gugush Haideh. My future guest today is an Iranian-American musician and the son of a prominent Iranian artist who you could argue can also be identified with that one name, the late singer, songwriter, musician, composer, Habib. Take a listen to this. من مرد تنهای شبم مهر خاموشی و لبم تنها و غمگی رفته هم دل از همه گسسته هم تنهای تنها غمگین رسوا تنها و بی فردا منم تنهای تنها غمگین رسوا there you go. I'm guessing a lot of you out there remember that song or know it from 1977, Mar de Tanhoye Shab. That's Habib. 
Habib's musical journey began with a, a profound interest in the guitar, and by 1977, he rose to fame with the release of that hit record, Mar de Tan Hoya Shab, featuring the renowned title track and another popular song, Shah Loya Man. This success was followed by his second album, Salam Ham Soye, in 1978, and Habib's significant contributions to Iranian music then solidified his legacy as a professional and influential musician, both in Iran and in the diaspora. He passed away in 2016, leaving behind a lasting impact on the Iranian music scene, and notably at the time of his death, he could not pursue his career in music inside Iran after years of being exiled and having his career derailed in its prime. To discuss the story, the sadness, and the immense legacy of Habib, it's an honor to be joined by his son, Muhammad, today. Muhammad was born in Tehran and raised in Los Angeles. He worked with his father on his own debut album called Javuni in the early 2000s. He's a musician, a singer, and Muhammad has also been very active on social media since the beginning of the uprising last year, dedicating a, a few songs he created to the women life freedom movement in Iran. And right now, I'm joined by Muhammad Mohabian in Los Angeles. Hello, sir. Hello, dear Jean. Thank you for hosting me in your show. Thank you for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you, Muhammad. Thank you for doing this. And I have to say from the top, you know, approaching an interview like this, I would uh, I would often feel trepidatious about asking someone who has their own career, their own life, about their famous parent, especially to lead the interview this way. But you've said you really want to speak about your dad, so we've titled this episode The Legacy of Habib. Tell me about wanting to talk about him. Yeah, well, you know, I owe everything to him. Uh, Every thing I've learned, I owe to him. Just growing up with him, seeing his journey, being part of his journey, and the originality of the person he was, I have nothing else to talk about but him, frankly. You know, he, I mean, he was very famous, um, and he was masterful as a songwriter and musician and a singer, but he's not always cited amongst the biggest names in Persian popular music. You, you've told me that you think that's partly because he was a loner, partly the way he led his life. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, you hear it in Maratana Aishab too. It could be a double meaning, my Maratana Aishab. Um, you know, when he rose in Iran, he kind of, he, not kind of, he rose by himself. He had bands that he would play with just in Tabriz and Reza yeah, before he became popular and after he broke Maratana Ishab he was just you know he wasn't so much into getting together party buzzy and that kind of stuff he was just kind of in his own world an introvert artist and um, that's all that was important for him just to create and to give out nothing else was you know really made any difference or caught his attention it's oxymoronic isn't it it's a contradiction to be a, a popular performer who takes the stage and also an introvert yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that it's and that's how it was and that's even when we came to the united states um in the mid 80s he experimented two albums uh, hamras being one of them Oshid Khanum being another one, which were kind of poppy. They were um, the diaspora in LA at that time. They encouraged him to do that. They said, this is what works right now. You know, those sad songs or songs about social issues and stuff, but people don't want to listen to that here. People just want to, you know, have a good time. And, you know, it got to where my father just felt uncomfortable with having done that, even though a lot of those songs, Hamra's, Sadai Fagyad, they're all, they're all different still. You know, they are uh, the six eights kind of poppy, but they all they're still his stories. They're yeah. still stories of they're still kind of sad. You know, he couldn't leave that. But yeah, after that, I remember he left the valley where you know the community was condensed, and we went to the South Bay, and he just stayed there and did the recording until I came along. And I was, you know, for me, he came back in the scene kind of and became poppy just to, you know, just for me. Let me get to all of that because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rich and 
interesting story. But uh, you know where to start and end. Well, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is it fair to say? I mean, even starting back to the 1970s, let alone later on in L.A., etc. Is it fair to say that Habib didn't um, play the game, if you will, the music industry game? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. I mean, that's what I've always seen. That's what I've always seen. Same thing with Farhad. Same thing with um, songwriters. Feridun Furuki, um, Kuroshi Armai. Yeah, pretty much all the ones that are creators, it seems like. Tell me a bit about what his inspirations were. Obviously, Iran before the revolution was a different place and time. He's born in the late 1940s. Uh, he's growing up in the 50s and 60s. I, I understand he was heavily influenced by Western pop, like the Beatles, right? Beatles. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. First and foremost, Beatles, John Lennon. Um, you know, I would hear him sing all, you know, songs that, oh, you know, I, I still hear him, you know, today on, you know, in American stations and stuff, oldies and rock oldies and that's that's where his influence came and that's what his music became he became a new genre of like country country rock which was you know it's his own school you could say in iranian music and yeah. yeah that's what it was he definitely stands out i mean one of the reasons why he really stands out is his he's got this remarkable voice which is um uh it almost defies anybody like it's it's like a it's like a, a a career liability to try and cover a Habib song because then you have to kind of you have to try and sing like him, which is uh I have this old canard like my my old joke is because my idol is David Bowie you know nobody should ever cover cover Bowie because nobody could sing like Bowie and I feel like there's something like that going on with Habib and by oh, really? by the seventies he's singing on Iranian TV. This is before his military service and even before his first record. How would he describe those years, if you can remember what he would say about that time? You know, I mean, all the good memories he's had of Iran, all the memories that he always shared with me of you know how good Iran was, was from that time. Yeah, that's how he described it. He just enjoyed what he was doing and it was kind of difficult because he comes from a conservative family so there was a little clash there but you know he did what he loved and he was good at it and he left his mark how did he negotiate that the becoming a a, a pop a, you know pop rock singer uh, coming out of a conservative and even religious family you know, anyway his mother loved him and his mother was a really good mother it wasn't like conflict or stopping and stuff. It was just, they felt something about it. So one memory that my father shares is he, he was singing a Beatles song in one of these uh, TV programs that you're talking about before he became big. And his mother had seen it. And either on TV or radio, sorry, it might be radio. And when he came back home, my, his mother said, what, what was this, this barking you were doing? I didn't understand anything. So, that's what it was. Do you remember what song it was? I don't. No, it was a Beatles song. It was a Beatles song. But he would have been singing it in English, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's yeah. amazing to me because, and there's a whole um, historical explanation, cultural ex explanation around this, about what happens after the revolution when um, music, uh, Iranian po popular music starts to shift its space to say Los Angeles and there there starts to be a cachet in singing in Persian because people for nostalgic reasons or for identity reasons want to hear the Persian but there's this period in the 70s where actually a lot of Iranian singers are singing in English. There's that, those videos of like Ebi and Shahram Shahpareh singing in English um, yeah. which is quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean 70s was just, you know, when disco and rock was being born and 
Yeah. And it, it, it affected the world. It influenced the world. What was Muhammad? What was Habib's special secret sauce? I mean, that the first album comes out in 1977. He, of course, not just being an interpreter, not just a singer, but he writes the songs, he composes the songs, he records. The first album's massive. Um, it's also a victim of its timing. It comes out just a little before a revolution that would change yeah. everything in Iran, in, in Iran, including his chances of continuing to build his musical career there. But but for that moment, what do you believe made him so great? You know, his feelings. His, he just went, he would go deep into his feelings. Lyrics were very important for him. Um, he always said that it's lyrics that make a good melody, like someone could make a good melody out of. And it starts from there. Um, there are a few lyrics that he had said himself. He wrote himself. Um, he just it's it's a it's a it's an ingredient. You know, it's an ingredient, and and being ded dedicated to uh, doing what you love at its best. I think, yeah. From your observations, would would he write the lyrics first, then and and then put music to them? It, you know, it depends. There's I've seen him get lyrics and put melodies on it. I've seen him make a melody and like put a mer on it. He would call it mer, uh, share mer. So he would be kind of like lyrics where he considered weak and he would give those lyrics to a lyricist and the lyricist would finish it. And he would put it in that lyricist's name, not all, but there's a few songs that have, that are like that. Um, yeah, it, it depends. Sometimes he would put the melody on lyrics, sometimes vice versa. It depends. I want to I want to play a bit of a song from that era, another big song, Maudar. I've always felt this song was um, particularly compelling. Um, we, we, story. Well, 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 tell me actually before we play a bit of it, what what does it mean to you, and what's the story behind it? Well, he was in Reza or Tabriz right now. I'm forgetting, uh, but you know Azerbaijan performing, and he gets a phone call where his uh, siblings tell him that, come, you need to come back to Tehran. Mother is not feeling well. So he understood, you know, you understand from the person's voice and how they're telling you to come that, you know, something has happened. And that night he, he said the story on TV before too. He um, goes on stage, he performs, and actually he writes the song before he goes on stage. Wow. He writes Mada, yeah. And he performs it on stage. And while he's crying, there's people dancing tango. He always, he always recalls that. And that's, yeah, that's how it happened. Wow. And then he went back to so, so and stuff like that. He would have written it pretty quick. That was really from his heart. And when you listen to the lyrics of Mada, it's just, we don't have anything like it. So close to the heart and just, yeah, if you play it, you'll see. The original Mada. The first mother. Mother, bit of that home of Ariba. What of a Korea, bit of a sad ازای خون بی بوی تو هیچه صدای تو هنوز اینجا می پیچه مادر مادر واو wow. You know, after you telling that story, it's always sounded like a passionate song to me, but it takes on a whole other meeting. Meaning, I, I can't. I still hear your voice, me uh, pichina. Yeah, I, I still hear your voice uh, everywhere. And and Muhammad, that's another one. Uh, that's uh, that's Habib, of course, from from the late seventies. That that's a, that's another one where I mean, he has this remarkable uncanny ability and i'll talk about this 
later in the interview too, I want to talk about a couple of other songs that are like this, where he's walking this line between profound pathos, like sadness, um, and and you hear that and you it, it almost might, wants to make you cry. And at the same time, it's got this like, jaunty melody and like the bass line you know it's it, and you almost go is, is this a celebration what and and it's it's this remarkable mix that uh is, is really quite unique yeah yeah you, you'll find out that a lot of that in a, in a more exaggerated way in, in the hambros album actually it's like said i find you it's upbeat hambros it's upbeat but it's sad it's kind of a a, a trope of persian you know, pop music, at least up until a certain period that, that it's gamgin, you know, that we were always writing sad lyrics and stuff. Why was he, was that reflective of his personality or is that just what he was attracted to in terms of how he emoted in song? Probably both. I mean, he did have a difficult time. He did have grief that he shared, but he also, that I guess growing up, and becoming a musician for him it's that made that had more meaning creating that than you know like a upbeat six eight dance song he saw relating to social issues and you know sad events more in feeding the heart mm. than otherwise you're you're born words. yeah it's okay i mean you're doing it you were born in Tehran just a little while, like three three or four years after that debut record comes out. How and when do you become aware as a kid that you had this famous and talented dad? Well, you know, when I was really small in Iran, I mean, couldn't really then because the guitars were hidden. You know, if I know if anyone came to our house... You know, it was just, I don't remember any of it then, but I remember when we left and when we were in Turkey, um, he would, in the, in the hotel, he would sit and play the guitar and people would come around him, you know. Um, friends of friends, you know, it was just the people in the hotel all knew each other. And they were all Iranians that had escaped. And same thing in Italy. And then I... It, you know, remembering it, how I thought about it as a kid, it was, I still didn't know that my dad's this rock star. I didn't know that, hmm. but I knew that people knew him, you know, I, I didn't think about how that far. I was really small, right? but even when I came to the States, um, growing up, it's still kind of the same thing because it's, it's weird, you know, okay, we're not in Iran, you know, we're a diaspora here. And, you know, I would see other singers and other artists, too, and when we lived in the Valley, and that was a popular apartment complex where everyone went through. <laughs> uh, it wasn't until I myself uh, started with my father and when we started touring and I saw, you know, that's when I saw it. Yeah, that's when I really saw it. The con like, his wow. connection to people, the people. Yeah. Or the people's yeah. connection to him. Yeah. I, you know, I'm just, I'm still stuck on the idea that you're this little kid in Iran. Um, You know, I so often think about, I mean, it's something I've been thinking about for years. I did my university uh, graduate thesis on revolutionary Iran. You know, I, I think about that. Uh, sometimes I think about what happened in 1979 as almost like a sick social experiment. You know, what happens when you when you change society overnight and you eliminate, you, you suppress um, all all forms of culture. So this kid whose dad is a rock star doesn't even know that, isn't even aware of of like the musical instruments aren't even allowed to be put out in the house. It's 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 a bizarre. Um, uh, ecosystem that that could only be created in a situation like that. Like there's no, there's no other scenario where somebody wouldn't be aware of something. I mean, even the even if even if the you know stars always say, "Oh, my kid doesn't think I'm cool." They you know, but they they're aware that the parent is a star, right? 
Um, but you, you don't even have that opportunity in Iran. Yeah. Yeah. The Mullahs took over, you know? I mean, I'll, I'll ask you about his decision to move back to Iran in 2009, but that early period, like the 80s, when you guys leave, what what do you think moving to and being in America was like for your dad? You know, I mean, when we left, I guess it was very hard for them. You know, I, I remember, you know, just remembering the leaving was is just going through Turkey, going through Italy, it's just you're, you're always yearning for home. You don't have your, you know, big family around. I didn't have my grandmother anyway. Uh, for him, I I remember what my mom would tell me in Turkey, he would go to the ocean, you know, by himself and just, you know, pray and come back, you know, just to let his heart out. Um, and coming to the United States, I he always felt alien. He always wanted to go back home. And he thought, I think, yeah, he thought, as my mom tells me, when when we when he left Iran, they didn't think that this curse that came after the revolution would stay so long, you know. I mean, of course, they created a yeah. war and all this stuff con- that continues, that's keeping them. And that's what he thought. And you know, he just, you know, it just beca- becomes, you know, time just passes, China, time just passes, and uh, he never assimilated to this society like like many have like many had to the american society um it's a little unfortunate i think and why do you why why do you think he i mean to, to be clear you know even those that have made their life in los angeles or vancouver or toronto for many decades still obviously feel this pining for the iran that was or hopefully some Iran of the future or whatever it is. But but why do you think he could never quite feel, um, could never make home in a place like Los Angeles? Because his home was Iran. His home was Iran. And, you know, it's just, why can't I be in my own country? Who are these people that are not let, letting me live and be who I am in my own country? Um, you know, all, all artists, everyone, artists, non-artists, everyone feels that to different levels. You alluded to this earlier about the the music of that starts emerging out of Los Angeles in the '80s, and I've got to say, I mean, I've said this before on this program. I'm not I'm not a big fan of some of the cheesy LA Persian pop of the '80s and '90s. Like I just never got it, you know. But while that was dominating the sound of Persian music at the time. Uh, like I, like we said earlier, I mean, Habib didn't entirely play the game. He's got those records that come out in the 80s, but it, they still don't quite sound like that L.A. sound. How yeah. does he manage to stay out of that and for that to become the second half of his career until now, you know? By not listening to anyone and doing his own thing. Yeah. And that's what, you know, takes you kind of out of the party. <laughs> so... Yeah, I would imagine there would be pressure, though, to sort of like, again, to, maybe I'm overusing the term, but to play that game in, you know, in order f- for career reasons. Right. Yeah. Well, that's why he came out and, you know, he started working. He started working here in L.A. and still supporting himself and making his albums. And that's why I say he was true, true to his word. Um, yeah, for him making what he wanted was more important than being in the flash of the scene. By the 1990s, he's making music that's um, fair to say widely heard again. This time he's in L.A., but he's, he, he puts out a popular record called Bezan Baron, 
Um, tell, tell me about that period. We're going to play that song actually at the end of our chat, but um, tell me about that record from your point of view. Yeah, this is where he went back to his heart and uh, recording with Lou Barujan. He recorded with Lou Barujan until uh, Jabuni. And yeah, Bezan Baron, Kadin Rodom Kardand. Uh, that's where he, you know, with full strength, went into the heart of uh, not just the Islamic Republic. These lyrics, you know, are not, yeah, they're meant for the Islamic Republic, obviously, but they're also lyrics that will always stay in time. They will always be, you know, because the Islamic Republic is like a, you know, bad dream, it's going to come and go. But, you know, Dino Dom Kardan, Bazan Baron, it's something that's always been done and could be done again in the future. And all of his lyrics that are, most of his lyrics that are, you know, social, political, are everlasting. In that period, would you describe him as, was he bitter? Bitter? You know, he was always a little angry. He was always a little angry. And I guess it had to do with not being home. And I guess it also had to do with, you know, doing his own thing and just uh, not, I don't know. When you see like that, what what you mentioned, like what's happening in LA, the cheesy pop and stuff like that, while, you know, Iran is the way it is, you know, we mustn't forget. So maybe that upset him a little bit. You, you would have been a teenager when that record comes out. Yeah. Um, a, a few, just a few years later, you start singing and playing with your dad. But but before that, in the 90s, what was your relationship with him and his music like? You know, I didn't, I was mostly at that time listening to his Maratana and Shab and Madan album. I, I Yod on a Man like was one of my favorite songs at that time. I was more more in there. And also Hamra's and that kind of stuff. I wasn't at the level to understand Bezambara and Kabira Bob. I'm still, you know, it's still so much to understand about these lyrics. But yeah, I was still, I was too young then to understand what that was. Wow. Uh, to, to what, what does that mean? Not at the level to understand. My Farsi wasn't so well, you know, and just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, you know, his... Monhasir Bafad. You have to, yeah, just lyrics wise, I guess you could say. Yeah. Was it was it always kind of a an expectation or, you know, uh, a calling that you were gonna be a musician as well, that you were gonna be a singer? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. When he saw me sing here and there, just at home, you know, it it. it impress them he would say oh like this or like that but you know seeing how the party buzzy was he always warned me that yeah this is not what you want to do and but you know we did it and it was successful what did, when, when we say party, you know, I, saw, I saw good sides and bad sides of it right when we so, say party buzzy like what uh if you were trying to <laughs> if you're trying to describe what that means to a non-iranian what would you what would you say there, there there's probably I mean, there's non iranians listening I, I, you know what do no. we what do we mean when we say party buzzy well for example you know it's just you you have so many friends and you know just you you hang out with the people or or whatever uh you let me just say what happened to me then maybe that's better. Sure. Better example. Sure. Um, recently, in this uh, Woman Life Freedom, uh, last year, um, but first month I gave a song out, Faryad Khan. Shadi, 
And, you know, I just immediately recorded it and just put it out. I wasn't thinking about, um, you know, do advertisement here, do that there, do that there. No, it was a very raw moment, you know, just give it out and be part of the movement. Um, I gave it to some, I'm not going to name, to some arenas that should have, do have um, aired in the past. But when I gave this, I saw, you know, pause. And someone that I had on the inside told me that so-and-so has sung the same, a song with the same title, also called Ariyotko. And they have paid for, they've done a video, they're paying for advertisement, this and that. That's why they're not giving it out. I'm like, no, it can't be. You know, it just can't be. <laughs> now, in this time, uh, and a few days later, I saw that theirs came out. And I was like, wow. So that kind of stuff, that's kind of extreme, maybe. But that stuff, yeah, had existed for my father as well. You know, if he's going to be in this concert, you know, and his name is going to be there, um, I don't want to, you know. All right. And my father was never into that stuff, you know. Even when I was singing with him, you know, so-and-so, they would w want their name first. Hello, there was like a new Mickey Mouse singer. My father wouldn't say anything about it. He would let the concert guy take care of it. So by that, I mean like stuff like that. Gotcha. Yeah. Tell, tell me about playing, starting to play and, and sing with your, your dad uh, in, in the early 2000s. What was the, what was the eureka moment where you guys look at each other and go, all right, Let's uh, let's try this thing together. Or, or, or I mean, did you approach him and say, Dad, I want to do this with you? Or did he come to you? How did it work? You know, I was always into, well, first of all, I found his song, mm -hmm. you know, I found it in a cassette, very old cassette uh, from Iran that when he had recorded and, you know, before Maritanish, I was like, you could tell it's just like a little band, daka, daka, daka. But it was a really nice song. I would always play it for him. I'm like, Dad, this is really nice. Let me sing it. Let me sing it. Eventually, he recorded it. But, you know, when I heard it, I, I, it wasn't something I could sing. It wasn't something at that age I thought was me. You know what I mean? So and I, I just couldn't sing that at that time. Hmm. And so he sang it. Following that album, you know, I started telling him what I like and showing him examples where he um, created Javuni for me. Uh, he wrote the lyrics, uh, he did the melody, and he did the arrangement with Lou Barucha. And that is, um, yeah, I sang that song and a few other songs, and then we started going around and checking the market out. That I mean, that becomes the first album and it does very, yeah. very well for you. Did you... I mean, the obvious question is how how do you deal with being in the shadow of somebody who's considered, you know, legendary? I mean, you know, there's. It seems to me that a lot of kids there's usually when they, when they have a famous parent, they either follow in the footsteps somehow or they go the exact opposite, like they rebel and run as fast as they can away from you know uh, things because they don't want to have to compete with the. Uh, let the sh live in the shadow of their of their famous uh, parent. H how did you deal with that? N no, we didn't have any. I mean, it wasn't like there was other. There were some issues that that weren't necessarily between me and him, but just how things should have been done. It should be done like this. There, there wasn't just us. Uh, you know, for the Jabuni album, uh, eventually we went to Amir Rasimi, who also added some songs and some with the lyricist Puxima we were that's where we got introduced to Puxima and Schubert and he has a lot to do with the success of the album too I have to say uh, but yeah n not so much conflict between no no red hobat I would say more like hmm. you know you should have handled the situation like this you should have handled that situation like that um yeah and you would, and you would, you wouldn't, there wasn't like sort of a, oh my God, dad, leave me alone. You know, like I'm, I'm my own guy. Uh, you guys, it was harmonious no. for the most part. 
Yeah, yeah. That's that's a credit yeah. to him and you. And and how did he feel about your your um, shaggy blonde uh, boy band uh, locks? How did he feel about your hair? You know what? He would borrow my clothes <laughs> sometimes. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Is, you are very cute. You're very cute. I don't. I don't want to get. I want you to get the wrong impression. Now you were very cute at that time. I'm not taking it away from you. I'm just wondering how the, the iconic dad felt about it. Uh, no, he didn't have a problem with it. But I mean, there were some places where he would say, "Hit the brake," you know, not, "Don't go that far." Um, there was a thing about. Um, use i mean when you have an actress for example in your music video how far how much does this culture accept or not accept maybe this is too much there was stuff like that hmm. yeah mom and i want to play a song that you and your dad did together called ad what can you tell oh, yeah. what do you tell us about that that one the lyrics were written by Mina Jaloli, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And we sang that together, and that's one of the great songs. That's one of the great songs that we did together. It's it's always every aid. It's there. I see it around. And it's Toy Dio Dele Mani. That's all it is. Toy Dio Dele Mani. When did we record that? I'm thinking, is it after my heart surgery? I, we immediately I think it was before. Record? I think it was, it was 2005. Before? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm I'm wrong then. Sorry. Not Sorry. that I know your story, your history better than you, but I think that I think in this case I, I might be right. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Iran Bonu. It's in the Iran Bonu album. Let's play a little bit yeah. of AD. This is Habib Ben Muhammad. of the song A.D. Habib and Muhammad from 2005. You know, it occurs to me, like, I uh, certainly in Persian music, I can't think of a lot of father and son or parent and, and child, um, you know, hugely successful duo. I mean, I know Reza Rohani and his dad have done some performances together, but, but nothing quite like this. And even in music in general, I mean, it's pretty hard to... I think McCartney and his son did something at some point, or Jay Z and Blue Ivy. I don't know. There's not a lot out there. Um, what 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 was the audience like for this? Was there like a young contingent who would come for you and an older one for your dad? Yeah, yeah. I remember scenes like that. I remember scenes like that. But most the young ones, you know, they still they knew my dad. You know, they knew my dad. Their parents were there. <laughs> yeah. It was it was it was it was kind of like a complete show, because it covered everyone. Yeah, you you alluded to it a second ago, Mohammed. In in two thousand, I guess it's two thousand six, maybe you're playing in Dubai, and you end up needing surgery for, from what I understand, a childhood congenital, congenital heart issue, and and I guess you need to go to Iran for treatment. Um, that would have been scary for all kinds of reasons in terms of what's happening to your body. But tell me about that whole experience of going to Iran at that point. Maybe it was 2008. Okay. Oh yeah. Maybe it was 2008. We were in Dubai and we had been there for a few months and I was sick. You know, I had other issues going on. There was a colon, uh, there's an infection going on in that area, which wasn't healing. Mm -hmm. Overall, I was not feeling well. I remember having fevers and just staying home. It was just, what's the, what's the word? Convulsions, convulsions, yeah. It, it was, I was not well. And when I would go to the doctor, we would go to emergency room like twice a week maybe. And there was a few times I remember they did my heart and they're like, there's, you know, he, he needs to see a heart doctor. And it had been, it had been 
a while since I stopped seeing a cardiologist just because like it was an annual since I was a kid. I thought it was not a big deal. So my heart had gotten enlarged, and I guess this was stressing everything else and doing its normal um, thing. So it was so bad that I couldn't come back to the States. So me and my mom, we got on a plane, and we went to Iran. And immediately right there, I remember they took my passport away. I was, um, first of all, I was medicated. And I was, you know, when you're close to death, you you know, some people, or some people at least, you, everything, you just see positive. Nothing really matters. Mm. And, and you try to see everything positive. And so I remember my mom was like, <laughs> when we were in the room with the with the guy who took my passport and just asking questions, she looked at me and was like, boy, my toy could job or that, you know, like that. And I asked the guy, I said, oh, I said, oh, I said, worse than anything. I looked at my mom and said, oh, I said, but it was, in a way, it was my, the. it was one of the best times in my life, maybe I could say, because I uh, survived. Um, I was with my family. I saw my, some of my family there in Tehran and Travel with Tabri's family that I always heard about. Um, I remember the first time w- went out in the streets to drive. You know the the bricks with the yellow yellow small bricks. It's, Iran is famous for it. I saw those and with painting on them, and just everyone was Iranian, and it hmm. it, it felt really uh, like a feeling I'd never had before. It was also one of the worst times of my life, of course, um, just because you know being having to go to those interrogations was not a big deal, but being in the hospital and when I was recovering, could you imagine like you're in ICU and people are coming in and talking to you, taking pictures, jumping on your bed. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, to clarify, your dad didn't, doesn't <laughs> go with you, right? It's you and your mom who go. No. Just me and my mom. And, Just me and my mom. Were you surprised that um that you were getting interrogated? I mean, you're you're just this kid who was basically growing up in America. I mean, was it was was that part shocking for you? Yeah. The first the first interrogation, I remember we went, it was this the street called Afrira, and it was a building that has no windows. Just you know, big what is it? It's like no windows. And we went I and at that time, it was like, it happens every once in a while. Lights turn off, you know, in different sections, just as conserve energy. Lights turned off too. So imagine being in a building with no windows and lights are off. So yeah, we were waiting. There was a few other people waiting too. And then finally it was my turn. I went inside. It was two guys. And it was obvious later, you know, one of them was playing good cop, one of them was playing bad cop. And the first thing the guy said, he yelled. He yelled so loud that my mom said she could hear outside. What are you doing here? You know, why did you come here? And I just said, well, I'm sick. You know, and I came for see the doctor and stuff like that. Just, you know, it was weird because like they they kept repeating questions. The guy that was a good cop, he, he looked like he's doing algebra on a paper. I don't know, maybe it was like truth tests and stuff. And it, it was, was, it, it, was it, it was clear they knew. I mean, I'm a stupid question, probably, but they knew who you were, right? I mean, they knew. Oh your, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I remember the guy said, "You know, your father." It was weird, you know, different extremes, and maybe it was different interrogation. But he said, "When your if your father comes here, you know, we're going to immediately arrest him and take him to jail." I'm like, okay, I'll tell him that. Well, and then same guy. I don't know if it was in the next interview thing or that that one. He said. Yeah, if your father comes here, you know, or any artist, and they're here for two years and, you know, probation, and they go through the process, they can get permission to perform in Iran. So he said that, and he said that. I was just like, okay. Well, I, I <laughs> mean, in, in terms of the interrogations and the hardship, um, it's it's interesting that it's the it's a year later that uh, Habib, your dad, decides to to choose us to go back to Iran in 2009. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and that's a decision that will not just define, that, that will kind of define his final years. Um, and 
it could not have been an easy decision and it could not have been something that your mom would have taken lightly either. Um, what, 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 how can you best describe why he made that decision? You know, it's, first of all, his sister was sick. Uh, he's been wanting to go to see his sister for a while. My mom would go and come every once in a while. And, you know, that kind of made my father like, you know, left out. Um, and me going and surviving all that BS, I guess, you know, kind of made him think, okay, you know, let's, let me go try it out. You know, it's not, he risked it. I mean, he was brave. That's all I can say. Did you try and prevent him from going? No, I didn't. My mom did. I remember she said, Happy meeting there, Chikar and Kani. Um, I didn't. I don't remember preventing him. No. Do you regret I don't that? Huh? I do was you... recovering still, probably. Do, do you regret not trying to stop him somehow? Oh, totally. Totally, you know, totally. <laughs> What happens when he gets to Iran? So when he gets to Iran, uh, they take his passport like they did to me. You become al Khuruj because you can't leave the country. Uh, they have your passport. And in order to get that passport, you have to go through whatever process they have for you. You don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, they confiscate his computer there. Um, and just bad treatment. Uh, he got his computer back, yeah, a while later, maybe seven, eight months. It was returned back. I messed up computer. Um, and while he was, while that was happening, I guess towards the end, you know, people find out you're there, there's that, there's that. There's always people that come forward and try to help you and this and that. Some of them with good intention and some of them with bad intention. So he ran into a few people that said, you know, you can, you know, this is happening, this is happening, there's progress and uh, we can get permission for you, Mojavis, for you. You really don't have to do much. Just be here and we'll, you know, take care of everything else. And that's where it started. Yeah. And within the first year, within the first year, a year and a half, he, he realized that this is bullshit. And he told me not to, I don't need to come back anymore because well, I even when I went back while he was there after that incident of the heart surgery, again, you know, I was made mamna khuruj and I had to go through this whole process. They don't even know what they're doing themselves, you know, hmm. when you go to these offices and try to deal with them. And you were going to visit him at this point then, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that was the last time I saw him. Which, and... which is when? 2010 or 2011 yeah 2010 or 11 wow. 10 maybe was the last time i saw him a few years before he he dies how yeah. how do you just i mean how would you describe how would you characterize his final years in iran you know it was very it was difficult for me seeing this because um First of all, after that, within that year and a half, you know, he said some stuff. He did some stuff which jeopardized his situation there. Um, in an interview with Bahman Babazade, uh, he said, "Man which means because of my the beliefs in my heart, I don't need your mojavas. 
and that came out and he remained quiet you know he didn't remain quiet meaning he didn't say anything he didn't talk to anyone um all the gossip and stuff that would come out um on the media from all sides from outside iran saying oh look he went there he's gonna do a concert uh, from inside Iran, they just kept using his name for different stuff. Yeah, this is happening. That's happening. There's going through Ershad process. Uh, there's going to be a concert in May. She's Azadi. Like he didn't know about any of it. You know, I would call him. Or there's emails. I would email him. Do you know about this? He's like, Khudam khabar nadara. <laughs> so when he comes on stage, um, in Musikema, uh, mm. they had a thing that they brought him finally after that time he goes on stage and he says after six years of silence i finally could say something yeah and by the way i don't belong in this front row because they had sat in the front row he says i always like to be in the back and i thought this reward or this award is for myself you know i i've done nothing i've done nothing to to get such a reward but it was obviously for someone else he said i thought it was for me i had done nothing hmm. And he said a few other stuff, and he ends it with a with a poem, and anyone who sees that could see what you know he went through, and yeah. Needless to say, he can't, you know, he can't put out albums, he can't tour, he can't. Um, that that what makes this both more tragic and more infuriating somehow is that. It's not like, I mean, he would, I would perhaps describe him, you tell me if this works, as um, quietly defiant, or he spoke through his lyrics sometimes, but it's not like Habib yeah. is leading marches or, you know, out there, you know, animatedly uh, an activist against the regime. So it, it it's it's all the more damning, isn't it? Well, he has, he has. Uh, criticized them in different interviews in the past um and of course yeah his main outlet is his music but uh yeah that's how it was Mohammed, i know it's it's probably not a it's not the, the easiest thing to talk about but i I've obviously got to ask you you're you're in the states when when your dad dies um, t- tell me about his death. So, yeah, that morning I wake up and, you know, first thing I saw, first of all, was uh, a photo of him on the ground of the mortuary with, with sheets wrapped around him. So, uh, later to find out, that the Ostandar of Mazandaran, either the current Ostandar of that time or the former Ostandar, they're, they're mullahs, they're all mullahs, uh, gave permission or ordered the mortuary to open their doors because his son worked for Isna, one of these, one of their, I, I'm, I can't say the name because I can't remember, one of their um, internet magazines that posted this picture for the first time. So right immediately when he died, they, um, you know, did what they do. And I immediately, you know, had to go there because my mom was there. I, you know, started going after getting my passport done. They ordered my mom to immediately bury him. He was not allowed, not just to Feteh on Armando and Besh Zahra, but he was not allowed to take to be taken to his birthplace. You know, that's how it is in, in tradition. You're supposed to, you know, they take you to your birthplace to get buried. He was not allowed that. Um, they came to my mom's house while I wasn't there. And, you know, just, I guess you could say nice way of threatening. Um, when are you going to bury him? You know, I remember my mom saying, he's not a cucumber. I can't bury him right now. And um, when I got there, uh, oh, yeah, so that morning, I remember I went out. I was just in the streets walking. And sorry, 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 sorry Mohammed, are you, t- you find out by seeing this picture? Or- yeah. Oh, my God. 
Yeah. Well, I saw a few condolences on my uh, messages. And when I saw that, I immediately went to Facebook and Instagram and just I saw the pictures. That's the first thing I saw. It was everywhere. Tell me about that moment. You know, when I saw that, I thought they killed him. And I, I, whoa, I can't even describe. And you would see, I would see um, different links posting this picture. It was everywhere. And, and writing, if you want to see how Habib suffered, click this link. You know, and I would click it and I would find out if someone wanted to advertise their phone this, if someone wanted to advertise that. So, yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> So yeah, VOA called me while I was here and they asked me a question about Ahmadinejad this, that and I gave an answer which, you know, <laughs> after that phone call I didn't answer anyone else's phone call because I immediately got a call saying don't um, speak to any of these, you know, stations because you're going to have a problem when you come back. So when I went, got back, um, you know, and I met my mother. To Iran, you mean? Um, I would get phone calls saying to come to such and such place. Uh -oh. I got many phone calls. By the third or fourth phone call, they started saying, again, you know, it means we'll retrieve you in some other way if you don't comply. And I didn't go. I didn't go to any of them. I we kind of complained through sources that, you know, we had close, like, what is this, you know? I'm uh, mourning, I don't even know what's going on. And they want, you know, and, and really, it's like you're you're so busy and and all this stuff happening around you and they want me to go sit down somewhere and talk to them about what, you know? Um, so eventually that first time, I got out in peace. But everything we wanted to do was was clamped down you can't do this you can't do that um i had to go to the mortuary where they forced him to be buried and i had to do adai ihtaram you know for the graves of the shahids you know so they don't get mad at my father being buried there and it was just it's just a whole ridiculous shit show and you know i had a background in growing up here you know going after Islam and stuff, and I was, know how to give the azan and stuff like that. And I remember they knew this, and they said, "Yeah, you should come and give the azan." It was the fortieth, or it was Eid of Fetr. It's Chelum Eid of Fetr. If you want the Chelum to happen, um, you should come in this morning and give azan. And uh, you know, I didn't have a problem with doing that, but I think they use that in their advantage as well. But yeah, it it's, just it just sounds horrible. I mean, it sounds like I'm so sorry for you. Know, you. It, it was just such a it was hell. It was hell. How how it do was, you how do you, I mean, as a person, how do you react in these situations? Do you cry? Or are you someone who gets angry? Do you start yelling? Do you turtle? Do you just go in the corner of a room and what what? How does Muhammad? Re I mean, tell me about your own reactions to all of this. You know, that first time. No, I surrender to everything because I have to, I have to, you know, be there for my mom. You have to be the strongest you can be. That's the only choice. You have no other choice but to be the strongest you can be and just remain quiet to everything because, you know, I just didn't have time for any bullshit. That was the first time. And um, the what? last time I went was... At the beginning of COVID, again, again, you know, I wanted to. It was kind of a scary situation. Oh my God, what's going on in Iran? I wanted to be there for my mom, and that was the last time I went there. Again, when I entered 
the airport when I entered in. They took my passport and they made me sit. I had to sit for at least an hour, hour and a half maybe, until these two guys came and then they sat down and just started asking me all this random question. There I lost it. You know, I remember losing it there. Uh, oh yeah, where did I lose it? So yeah, this is bullshit. I was answering them aggressively because I didn't have time. And the guy kept saying, oh, you know, why are you taking it so, why am I taking it so seriously? Why are you wasting my time amongst so much other bullshit you make everyone go through? So then they took me to the, a phone. I, my, my cell phone didn't work because it's the airport. I don't know the number of the person outside, so many things. So they took me to a phone to call the people outside to ask my address, because I don't know where I'm staying, you know, and so on. So I get their phone, this is in the middle of, you know, the beginning of COVID, where Iran is the most dangerous, one of, if you remember, one of the most yeah. dangerous places. Yeah. And I'm holding this dirty phone, you know, <laughs> and I look at them and I'm like, I don't know COVID on the phone that he's doing. And one of them said, no, there's no COVID here. I took the phone, I threw it, at the wall, I said, eat whatever shit you want to eat. And I went and sat down and put my feet on the table. <laughs> what happened after that? They called. Yeah, they took the number and they called themselves to get the address. That's You're lucky you didn't get to... So I can. Yeah, I was lucky. Yeah. I was lucky. I mean... I was lucky. Uh, uh, they kept calling me after that as well. They kept calling... We want to see you. They kept calling, but it was difficult to want to see them because they kept closing the borders of the um, Ostan states to each other because of COVID again, traveling restrictions because of COVID. Wow. There's a, there's a lot of people who pine to <laughs> go and see Iran, people like me who can't for political reasons, et cetera. And then, and then there's um, people who go and say oh my god it's so great it's like luxury and i stayed in five star hotel and all this kind of stuff or or whatever uh um or they just describe that it's really beautiful and they love going there you're you're you you be in the category of not a fan right you you don't no you're not you're not enamored of iran at this point no no i mean i don't understand what's so you know i had a cousin who this last time actually who he kept telling me, yeah, you know, when you have money in Tehran, there's, there's, you can do this, you can do that. There's this, and I'm just looking at him. It's like, you know, you really don't know what you're talking about, um, because again, it's, it's Iran. You have these zombies on top of you everywhere. Um, even in their good times, they're in their good times, like, you know, they're try to put on a good face, like during Khatami's time. Um, there's still zombies, you know, in hibernation. Mm. And they shouldn't be in that position of owning the country and your life and everything. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's surrounded by that lack of culture, which is again, um, because of them, because of their presence. So yeah, it's not. I don't. It's not. Uh, even when I used to go in the, the beginning, and I was having a good time, I'm like this place is not that bad, you know. My relatives would say, uh, "You haven't lived here. <laughs> you haven't lived here yet." Your your mom has chosen to stay in Iran. Yeah. Is that hard for you? Yes. Yes, of course it is. Um, she. That's just how dedicated she feels. To my father um she's kind of been the i don't know, find a better word protector of his uh mausoleum there which has been vandalized twice so far who would vandalize his his grave well that the hayat omana of that mosque same people who tell me to come and do adai ehtaram for the graves of Basijis or whoever it might be. Um, there's cameras there. And when we asked them to bring out these cameras so we could see who it is, they wouldn't. So it's obvious. Uh, 
that this that last time when they destroyed the lights around it that was about a couple of years ago it was right after um i gave out a video on my instagram account um one of their people said oh you know iranians could come back artists could come back you know you're all welcome and stuff and i couldn't help it you know this was after the last time it came out. so i gave it a video and then uh iran international they reposted this video which got a lot of attention on social media at that time it happened within a week after that i believe interesting within a week or two yeah Mohammed, you're, you, I'm sure you've been asked about this. Your dad's name has been back in the news to a certain extent in Iranian circles because Moin, the famous Iranian uh, musician singer, uh, said that he wanted to go back to Iran. And uh, from what I understand, the regime responded with some, you know, outlandish kind of uh, statement that we're going to put you in jail then for 20 years or something. Have you been asked about that? And, and have you been in touch with Moin, or, or do you have any sort of words about that? No, I, I, well, they, I got contacted with from BBC and VOA. I did interviews with them talking about my father's experience and whether, you know, it's, it's a, it's the right thing to do. Um, I don't think Moin, I, I don't know, but I don't think he himself um, inquired this. I mean, everyone wants to go back, obviously. I don't think Moin would want to go back after the incidents of what we all saw. We're still in a revolution. Yeah. Um, it was a, a lady who asked the vizier of Ershad, and his response was, of course, this is, you know, you know, all Iranians could come back and da 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 da. And then she said, What about singing? And then he said, Yeah, you know, if, if they go through the process, the same process of killing you, killing your art. And then someone else said, Yeah, if he comes, he has at least 27 years of prison sentence. Right. So that's what it is. It's just a big, chaotic mess of right. everyone saying what they want to say. And, and it's just this just chaos remember yeah. chaos and control as ever That's as ever it's, everything is chaos oh, oh it's always chaos uh yes. unfortunately um you, I, and by the way i mean you you have been warned i mean you said it in one of your interviews uh, in persian that that you were warned to not do interviews in recent years tell 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 me what's changed your mind to do something like this today and and knowing that you have family in iran etc well, my, while my father was in, in Iran and alive, obviously I couldn't do interviews. I did do one at that time with Ami Wasami, and, and I I was kind of, you know, you you kind of can't say everything. So it's like, why have an interview if I can't say anything? And if it was in one of the TVs like VOA or, you know, one of the ones that show news, show what's going on, it probably would have been more of an issue. Um, so that's during that time. And also don't, you know, stop giving out videos too. And then after my father passed away, same thing. You know, I accidentally answered the phone that morning and it was VOA. So yeah, while I was going and coming, there's no way you can have um, interviews with TVs here and go and come in peace. So it was that. So you have you decided you're not going back at all now? Well, yeah. I mean, after I gave out that video where they vandalized my father's tomb after it, that was kind of, that sealed it for me right. Uh, right there. Before that, I had kind of been critical too, but very softly, very softly. But now it's a different stage. It's a different level. Um, we're, in, we're in a revolution. It's just going forward. It's just going forward. Yeah, and I and I should commend you because you've been um, tremendously active and uh, I dare say inspirational. You've you know a couple of songs you've put out that have gone very have been very popular and uh, in in terms of supporting the uprising and being outspoken and being there for women, life, freedom, and all of that. And 
I say that partly on an episode titled The Legacy of Habib because there is an intersection for you. And you've said that you feel your father's songs, even now a few years after his death and in some cases many decades after they were recorded, are more relevant than ever these days totally. in the days of the uprising. Tell, tell us about that. I mean, even before the uprising, I mean, you have, I have uh, fans of my father from Iran who make videos and send it to me. And after the uprising too, it's just, you know, everyone relates to his songs and they would be take Bezan Baron and put it on, you know, um, events of right now. Um, everything, yeah, all those songs that he sang, they're about, they're, they're all happening. And they've been happening, but now it's at a time where we all see each other and we're all we all realize that you know we're all fed up and we all see each other and it's never been like that and that is because of massa that happened and yeah again these um songs are eternal these lyrics are eternal um the islamic republic is just a nightmare that's that it also describes what what do you what do you miss most about your dad? That's difficult to say. Everything, everything. He was very funny. He had not meaning to be. He was just, yeah, uh, yeah. His his lines. He would say the funniest things sometimes. I just miss him. Yeah. Which part? But a few days ago, I was remembering something about the same thing. Um, I got a haircut. I get it every couple of weeks. And I was remembering once I got a haircut, and when I came home, my dad, he looked at me. This is the kind of jokes we would have with each other. Of course, it was always him. He looked at me and he said, Jaya Posh Rushuna Hotel. And I just looked at him. I, I'll never forget. It was like when I was an early teenager, I looked at him. I was like maybe 15, 16, 17. And it took me a minute to get it, you know. But I, and I started laughing. He was just like, and he was pretty funny. He was a good father. I really, I really yeah. appreciate this today. I really, I'm really glad to be able to do this in English and to have some document and uh, of, of of talking about your dad and and to have you do it it's um uh it's it's been very special and i really appreciate you putting the time and going to that place thank you for doing this thank you thank you for the questions you ask and thank you because this is yeah the first time i get to speak about him in english and i, I want you to come back on and talk about religion one day we got to talk about we, we have to talk about islam yeah, there's a lot to say about that as well. <laughs> there, sure, there sure is. You just <laughs> mentioned Bezan Baran. I want to go out on that. Thank you again, Mohammed. It's been a pleasure. And um, uh, yes. I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully, before too long. Thank you. Take care. Merci. Khodafes. Khodafes. From 1996, Bezan Baron, the great, the late Habib. 
It's a really powerful song. Mm-hmm. Very. I, I really uh, appreciated Muhammad coming on. Mm-hmm. Um, what a what a story! Like I, you know, I honestly thought it was just going to be another son talking about the father, who's a musician, that sort of thing. But there were so many things he said that really just spoke to me, especially the part about him going back to Iran and, um, you know, having to deal with not only the death of his father but also the games that the hurdles yeah. he had to jump through, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, that was one, and also him not realizing his father was so famous until. So much <laughs> yeah. longer. Yeah. Well, uh, well, that part is, as I said in the interview, I thought, as he was saying that, I was thinking, how m- you know, that doesn't happen mm-hmm. in the West. If yeah. you're, you know, if you're a major rock star, you don't. I mean, that only happens concomitant, like uh, simultaneous with a culture that suddenly shifts so dramatically mm-hmm. that you're not allowed to have guitars hanging around. Yeah. You know, like. It's uh, and so the kid grows up not having no idea. Exactly. That's so. That's wild. It, that that part, I was just like, wow. You know, the the part he said we would have to hide the guitars. I was like, and, and it's funny because it's not the first time I'm hearing that. Of course not. You know, how many other families do of we course, know? Yeah. Who went through the same thing? But just hearing him talk about it in the context of him not realizing what a big name his father was. And, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's it's like. Um, you you can I I don't know how to get in the mindset, but you, one thing we can all relate to is COVID. You remember when COVID mm-hmm. happened, and for the first month, uh, for, for the in the beginning, you're you're kind of like this is crazy, but it'll be over in a couple of weeks, yeah. right? And then and and I think early in the revolution, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think I remember. I was a little kid, but I remember, you know, that there was this expectation that this is disastrous, this is horrible, but surely this isn't gonna last. Like mm-hmm. if you're someone like Habib, you're probably going, these mullahs are gonna be gone in a couple of years, surely. Like we gotta, you know, we'll regain this country and do, you know. Wishful and thinking. Yeah, and, and so you're kind of like waiting to a yeah. certain extent if, you're, if you haven't left already uh, for things to change. And, mm-hmm. then, and then the Iran-Iraq war happens. And then, you know, you're in a whole new cycle of tragedy and, and atrocity and, and um, and support for Khomeini, which he consolidates mm-hmm. with the with com- hand in hand with the war, you know. Um, I I also thought it was interesting. I mean, Mohammed's own the tension he feels with Iran, the mm-hmm. the fact that he's not he's not a fan, you yeah. know, uh, and yet his dad is uh, an icon, mm-hmm. and his mom won't leave because that's where his dad is buried and. You know, there's 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 so much tension in all of that, mm-hmm. and, and and sadly so. And I was again appreciative of how open Muhammad was about talking about all that. Yeah, very much so. But it's so it's so sad and tragic that this is the lives of this is the same story of so many Iranians that you have family there and you have this hatred or animosity towards the regime, but you have people who are either living or dead who are there and. Just the same sad story of, of Iranians across the globe. Yeah, it it th- th- we've always known this, and we've said it. I've said it since the day the beginning of this show four years ago. But but we but I feel it more and more all the time that no Iranian anywhere, despite what they think in some cases, has been left untouched by this revolution. Oh yeah, by that revolution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by the nineteen seventy nine yeah. revolution. Yes. Um, all right. So anyway, thank you again to Mohammed Mohibian, and thank you again to to Neely Interiors for being one of the uh, sponsors of this episode. Uh, we appreciate that. You can find out more about them in our um, description for this episode if you look down there on your podcast screen. So uh, I thought we we have a little time, Pega. You're here. We've mm-hmm. talked about doing a bit of a roundup, which we haven't done in a while, and um, there was actually some good news. Uh, not to just jump into politics because, of course, there's lots lots to round up mm-hmm. about uh, about that isn't politics in the Iranian space. But but there was some good news uh, ish, ish. Um, over the last few days. You saw it a lot in social media uh, with the release of a couple of journalists who had mm-hmm. been famously uh, detained in Iran. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so on Sunday, I think the 14th it was, um, Nidu Farhamidi and Elohim Muhammadi, who were the two journalists who broke the news of the killing of Masa Amini, they were released on bail. Um, and so the good news was that they were released. You know, there were photos and videos circulating that went viral of, of their release and how happy everyone was that they had finally been released after something like close to 500 days, I believe it was, that they were imprisoned. And unexpectedly, right? And unexpectedly, yeah. exactly. Because um, there had been a lot of push for having them released for months on end and there was no word or, or nothing about the fact that they might be or they they might not be and then all of a sudden they were released on bail. Now, this was the good news, but the reason we're saying ish is because shortly after that, um, we heard news of the fact that um, they were actually going to be prosecuted for violating hijab regulations. Yeah. Because if, if you saw the videos and the photos, um, I believe they were wearing hats, both of them, if I'm not mistaken, or one of them was wearing a hat, one of them was wearing a scarf, but it had kind of fallen off her head or something along those lines. And so, of course, now there's new charges being brought up against them. We don't know what's happening with that. They're trying to appeal it, but we have no idea what's what's going to come right. of that, of course. Good news-ish. Good news-ish, yeah. exactly. In a similar vein, well, not necessarily, but, but in terms of the, the names that became familiar to mm-hmm. Iranians around the world as a product of the uprising, there's Shervin, Shervin Hajipur, the, uh, the, the famous Bad Raya song, mm-hmm. who of course gets the, disappears, gets detained, gets released. Uh, and in the last week, there's he released a song that, uh, it's the most Shervin I've seen since mm-hmm. the Bad Raya days. Yeah. It, was got, it got shared a lot. Oh yeah. Shervin got shared. Um, <laughs> And it's an interesting song that kind of walks the skates the line mm-hmm. between being political and just expressive, um, quite quite craftily. So I yeah. thought the lyrics were really interesting to me because, first of all, the name of the song is Ashkal or Trash, um, and so you know when I first saw it I I didn't know what to think of it the word trash what does he mean what is he going to talk about in light of you know everything that we know about Shervin but it really was a testament to his nickname Pesare Iran or son of Iran because he talks about or rather emphasizes this continuous effort and determination despite facing challenges Um, and he relays it back to this idea of patriotism if you will um there's there's a line in the in the song that he says in ashgan mimune in shahro besaze this trash remains to build rebuild the city um and so the the lyrics are really interesting because on one hand you feel like he's talking about himself mm. and the struggles and everything but on the other hand you can also relay it to the struggles of the past year year right, and a bit right. so that was very interesting there's a um Something going on at the World Economic Forum. I, I oh, yeah. <laughs> happily tuned out of that, or I tried to. What is the story? It's been quite interesting, actually. So the World Economic Forum is taking place January 15th to the 19th in Switzerland. Um, this, of course, is um, you know a yearly event. It brings together um, politicians, um, businesses, business leaders, all sorts of things. And the aim is to improve the state of the world, mm. very generally speaking. Um, <laughs> that being said, yeah. um, a last minute invite was given to our dear friend, um, Amir Abdullah. Yeah. yeah. I mean, don't, maybe don't even say that <laughs> in case. Anybody, I say that sarcastically in case for anybody, anybody who understand hasn't the sarcasm, heard, yeah. you know. Um, and so he was actually given the opportunity to be on a panel or give a talk, something along those lines. And there's been a lot of, they, they can't help themselves. No, these, they in, really can't. these international organizations, they're desperate to get Abdullah Yan involved. I know, and, yeah. I, and I just the don't UN, get it. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the irony in all this is that this year's theme for the World Economic Forum is rebuilding trust. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and, and so yeah. there's been a lot of controversy about this. Democracy last... and freedom for women and men. Yes, you know, so, exactly. Something like that, yeah. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of controversy and a lot of talk about, you know, well, is this the best person to be bringing on um, and you know, given the fact that we're amongst about who is the controversy? Just Iranians? Well, or not just it? Iranians. Actually, okay. a lot of people, especially in light of the ongoing um, tensions with Israel and Palestine, you know, the role that Iran plays with that, yeah. um, and and also the last year and a bit, the atrocities that we've seen inside of Iran. Yeah. So all of that put together. 
Um, Which I'm sorry, feel generally forgotten by the Western world to me. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't feel like anybody's got the atrocities of Iran on the on the top of their brain no, these days. No, and not only do they not. Now, this part is a developing story, so I, I don't have too many facts about this. But um, it seems there was a, a, an interview or like a news, you know how they have like the media and people are walking out, that sort of thing. So an Iranian a scrum? news... scrum? Sure. Um, when, they, when they all... Uh, like make a circle around a politician and ask them questions? Yeah, or? I mean, I don't think it was intentional. I uh. think he was kind of caught off guard maybe. Okay. But um, an Iranian, and I say Iranian, so from inside Iran, um, reporter stuck a microphone in Farid Zakaria's face at some point throughout all of this. And he ended up... The the, uh, the noble Farid Zakaria. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we all, who doesn't love Farid Zakaria? Well, wait a minute. Right. We yeah. might not after this. <laughs> Um, and so he, he was asked a question and, and in reference to Amir Abdullahian, he yeah. calls him an honest man. Right. And so now there's a, there's a lot of... This Farid you know, Sagaria, I think he... I think... <laughs> he's just... I really, I really like trouble. him. I really like him. But yeah, I think, you know, he, when you're one of these guys that has the... I mean, he probably has all these guys on speed dial, right? I of mean, course. he interviews them all. Yeah. So you can't, you can't interview Putin... And <laughs> walk around calling him a jackass, yeah, right? That's fair. You don't have to say he's an honest man. Well, that's the thing. Do we yeah. need to go that far no. to say honest man? No. Now, again, I, I want to say this is a developing story, so I don't know. Maybe things have changed. Maybe it was out of context, that sort of thing. Well, right. well there's going to be more about this, but that's been the latest. Okay. Oh, I see. The whole thing was about Farid Zakaria. Your whole yeah, report that, about that was, the that was World huge. Economic Forum. <laughs> <No, laughs> that Farid Zakaria it said wasn't, that, No, the Farid Zakaria uh, part was the last part. The okay. whole thing is, you know, Amir Abdullahian's presence at the World Economic Forum. I, I mean, it might surprise him that he's that important. That we're talking <laughs> about a, a, an off-the-cuff comment he made about uh, honest man. Uh, well, finally, I, I wanted to. I thought we could mention. Uh, like it was just a couple of months ago that we had Gol- Golriz Qahraman on, mm-hmm. who has a. An amazing story of being a refugee and yeah. then working her way to become a human rights lawyer and then become uh, the first uh, MP in New Zealand who, a uh, member of parliament who was a refugee. That's right. Uh, and then she's, uh, you know, got herself, there's a little bit of trouble in the, in the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. So she just most recently resigned um, due to, I think it was, well, I don't know if I can even call it allegations anymore because there, there is some evidence of this but um she had it seems that she had shoplifted um at I, I don't think she's been convicted of anything no, but, she, but been she, convicted. she acknowledged it I yes think. She so did i don't think they are it. allegations yeah, so they're yeah. not yeah. allegations anymore um so she had shoplifted at at a high-end local boutique on um three occasions it seems and so as a result of this she stepped down and and um, made a statement uh it seems that mental health issues are part of the the reason why this happened she did she did mention that you know mental health issues and work stress had kind of led her to acting in this way which is completely out of character for her um and what i found interesting is that um you know her cabinet members also um went as far as saying that you know she's had a particularly difficult time um over the course of the last few years uh where she's received numerous threats um you know death threats um all sorts of things Mm. All, all in the time of serving, you know, or being being in this role. So, right. who knows if that had something to do with it? But it was definitely sad to see that news. I was yeah, very tough sad. tough days for her. But yeah. you know, she'll she'll probably come through that and yes. be okay. I mean, it's a, uh, it, um, it's more kind of I feel bad for her. For I mean, shoplifting is bad, kids. <laughs> you know, I'm not like yes, don't I'm not, do that. I'm not suggesting. Yeah, and 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 if it's. If it's sort of, uh, I mean, there's some news reports that she's done this a few times and mm-hmm. it's kind of her her thing, you know. Yeah. I think we're Winona Ryder was just once. Well, it wasn't, a- I, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, uh, but, there- but I, I, but, uh, but, you know, the hardest part is like, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of schadenfreude around these type of things, which of mm-hmm. course is the, uh, the German, you know, the, the, the word, that be, the, the delight people take in the misery of others. Mm-hmm. So I saw some Iranian media reports about it and people kind of making fun of her and, you know, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's the, that's a tough part for her. I'm sure yeah. if she's, she's probably shutting all that out, but uh, she, I, wisely so, but, but, um, you know, uh, people's, uh, uh, lives go up and down and, and mm-hmm. so this will, this will be a tough patch for her, but, uh, 
It hopefully, will pass. hopefully she'll yeah. This will it'll uh, for sure it'll pass and uh, just stop shoplifting would be the yes. would be the, <laughs> the message. <laughs> PSA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you, Pega. Thank you. That was a really interesting show. The legacy of Habib. Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. I learned. What's your so favorite much. Habib song? Mada, for sure. It just can you it name gets another song? You. Bezan Baron. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I recognize them when I hear them. But uh, really, that is my favorite song because I feel like it just. Mad the Tanhoya Shab? That's my no? dad's favorite. Oh. Mm-hmm. I love that song. Mm-hmm. That's a really. Yeah. That's a solid, solid song. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pega. You. Uh, thanks, everybody out there. Um, really interesting show we got coming at you next week. We'll tell you more about that through the week if you follow us on Instagram and our different platforms. And uh, our big uh, live show, if you're in the Greater Toronto area, at Theatre Aurora, February 7th. Limited tickets are still available for that. Go to the link in our Instagram page, or actually you can go to our website too, rookmedia.com, and probably find the link. Not probably. You can find the link from there. (laughs) This is full time for Rook for today. Uh, As I was saying, all things related to Rook, go to our website, rookmedia.com. You got the music, Super P? As I say, for all things Rook related, go to our website, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together and who create all things Rook related. Super Parisa, Smart Pega, Savvy Rohan, Bearded Omi, Talented Anahita, Methodical Kave, Resonant Raha, Get Better Raha. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already on any or all of our platforms. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. You can find us on Instagram and Telegram and YouTube at Rook Media. In the meantime, as ever, Mizunbashi. Bashi.